If you were listening to the scripture carefully, what was the will of the Father? That we believe on the Son that he sent, right? All right. If you want to really keep focused on the message this morning, you might just tally every time I say the word believe or believed or believing, any, any form of, of that particular word, and uh, that'll really keep you focused. I used to do that when I was a child growing up, and it always kept me focused on what the speaker was saying. Again, I want you to use your imagination. When I read my Bible, I like to get into the story, to feel the feelings, to smell things, to hear things, to see things, to be part of the story. It makes the Bible become much more real to me. I'm just going to share some stories with you. And it's focus on believing, as you see from the title. We can imagine that maybe it was a warm summer day as Jesus and his disciples are walking through Samaria. And they come to what we would call Jacob's well. And Jesus sits down to rest and the disciples go on in to a town. Now, they are in an area where it's called the enemy's territory. This is where the Samaritans lived, and the Jews hated the Samaritans and vice versa. But it was lawful for them to go and get food from them, but not to ask a favor from a Samaritan. Uh-uh, that was a no-no. You could buy something, but that was it. Jesus is sitting by this well. He's thirsty. He was a human being. But he had no way of getting the water that was just down at the bottom of the well. A Samaritan woman comes. And she ignores him because he's a Jew. She lowers her jug and she fills it up with water and turns to leave and Jesus asks a favor of her would you give me a drink of water this was quite an amazing thing to this woman and it stopped her right where she was and we don't have any indication she ever gave him any water but here was something extraordinary happening in her mind and she asks him a question how is it that you a Jew are asking from me a Samaritan a favor well Jesus did not answer that question instead he gives her a statement and he says to her if you knew who it was that was speaking to you you would ask him for some living water and he would give you living water. Now, this was quite an amazing thing for this woman to think about. She had asked him, how are you going to get water when you don't have a rope or a jug? Are you greater than the, our father Jacob who dug this well? Well, could Jacob, I mean, could Jesus have answered that question? Are you with me out there? Was he greater than Jacob? Oh, yes. He could have said, he could have said to her, yes, I am greater than Jacob. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But instead, he went on talking about this living water and how if, if she got it from him, she would never be thirsty again. And he then pauses and she asks him for the favor. Now this is interesting to me because first he asked her for water and now she turns around and asks him for this living water. Give me this living water. Well, she had the idea that she wouldn't have to come every day to get water from this well anymore. Jesus doesn't respond to her request, just like she didn't respond to his request. But instead, he asks 
her a question. It was more of a command. He says, um, why don't you go get your husband and bring him here? Oops. <laughs> that was not something she wanted anybody to talk about. And so she pretended that she didn't have a husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. I'm not married. I don't have a husband. And Jesus looks at her and he says, you're right in saying that you have no husband. You have had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Now, can you imagine what went through this woman's mind? Just put yourself in that picture. How did he know that? She'd never met Jesus before. How did he know that? I'm ashamed of my life, and here this stranger is telling me secrets about my life. How does he know? Well, she makes this statement. She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, was she right in saying that? Yes. He was more than a prophet. And then they had a further discussion about worship and where worship should be. And yet this woman was comfortable talking with Jesus. And even though he had revealed something that she didn't want anybody to know about, she felt that he was her friend, that he was not condemning her, and that he had pity on her, and that he loved her. And then when he told her, I am the Messiah, I am the one you say you're looking for. When the Messiah comes, he will answer all these questions. I am the one. Now, if I, I, I think I'm correct in saying this was the first person he had ever said that to, openly, to a Samaritan woman. Now, if you had asked her on what evidence she believed him, what do you think she would say? Was it because he started the conversation, which was unusual? Was it because of the brief conversation? Was it because he revealed her secret life? Was it just his mannerisms? Or a combination of all of them? <laughs> but we know that she believed him when he said, I am the Messiah. And scripture says she left her water and ran back to town. And she told the people there, come and see a man who told me everything about my life. Come and see for yourself. So they did. And they came out there. In John 4 is where this story is. You may want to have your Bible because we're going to be looking at several stories here in John. And the, 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 the people, the townspeople came out and they listened to Jesus, and then they invited him to come to their town, and he spent a couple of days with them. And notice in John 4, notice what they said in verse 41 and 42. And many more believed because of his own word. And they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Two days of preaching that Jesus was there. We are convinced he is the Christ. We'll find a little bit later that Jesus couldn't even get the Jews to do that, to admit that he was the Messiah. And the Christ. So I guess maybe at the end of this story we could say seeing and hearing is believing, right? Because they saw him and they heard him and then they believed who he said he was. Another story. Jesus just has left the house of Jairus. He has just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. 
he leaves the house and he tells Jairus, actually before he gets there, just believe on me. I can do this. And Jairus is believed. And on the way to Jairus' house, we have a woman who believed that if she just touched his robe, she would be healed. I've often wondered, what did she base her belief on? Who had she talked to? Who had she listened to? Had she, had she listened to the leper who was healed? I don't know. But she believed, if I just touch him, I will be healed. There was no doubt there in her mind. And Jesus, Jesus honored that belief. But going on in the story here, in, uh, this is in Matthew 9, we have Jesus going by, and there's two blind men there. And the Bible says he went into the house, and maybe these blind men followed him. And they wanted to know if he could heal them. And Jesus asked them this question. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Uh, I think we're about in verse 27. Okay, 28. Do you believe that I am able to do this? And what did they say to him? Yes, Lord. They believed that, they, that he could do what he said he could do. And he touches their eyes, and I can, in my imagination, he just puts two fingers on this guy's eyes, and two fingers on this guy's eyes, and he says, according to your faith, let it be unto you. So what was it dependent on? Their faith, their belief that he could do what he said he could do. And what happened? They saw for the first time maybe in their life. That was it. He said, do you believe? Yes, we do. It was done. Just like that. And the Bible says they went out and they parted. This is verse 31. And they spread the news about him for all over the country. So they were a witness to help people begin to believe on Jesus. They were a source of evidence, just like the woman who touched his garment, just like Jairus, just like Jairus' daughter, probably. Back over to John 9. Here we have a story of a man who was born blind. Born blind, never seen his mother's face, never seen his father's face, never seen anybody who was walking around him as he grew up. As far as we have from Scripture, Jesus didn't even talk to this man. At least it's not recorded there. There was a conversation going on between the disciples and Jesus. Was, was this man born blind because of his sin or because of his parents' sin? Jesus was carrying on a conversation. Now, I want you to put yourself in this man's position. He's sitting there and he's hearing this conversation. And then he hears somebody spitting. And then he feels some stuff being put on his eyes. If you were that man, what would you think? Ooh, somebody's putting spit on my face. Now, I've, in my imagination, felt like Jesus maybe picked up something and put it in his hand and spit in his hand and mixed it in like this. And then all that Jesus said to him was, well, that was recorded anyway, go and wash in the pool of Salome and you will see. In my imagination, I think maybe Jesus said, a little bit more than that. He said, you just need to believe that if you go wash, you will see. Now, again, put yourself in the man's position. What would you be thinking? How's that going to help? Uh, how far is it? Who's going to help me get there? Do I really going to see if I wash this stuff off my face? <laughs> I've often wondered what Jesus said to him that made him go. I've used my imagination and said, as you go, just say, 
I believe. I believe. I believe. And so the man, as he walks, he's saying, I believe. I believe. I will see. I'll see. And he gets there. <laughs> and he washes his face. And as he wipes this stuff off of his face, he opens his eyes. What emotion, you suppose, went through that man? Wow. And I can just imagine him taking off, running for home, shouting as he goes along, and people are looking at him. They know who he is. And his neighbors say, is this the same guy that was born blind? Yes, I'm the same one. And he rushes home, and everybody's asking me, how did this happen? How does this happen? He says, all I know is some man named Jesus put spit mud on my eyes and told me to go wash, and I did, and now I can see. Now I can see. Now this happened on the Sabbath day, and this caused quite a to-do with the Pharisees and the leaders, and they called this man in, and they had quite a heated discussion there. I really like this discussion that this man had because he basically preached to them, and they didn't like it. And they eventually... Kicked him out of church, which was a really big deal for a Jew. And Jesus knew that this had happened. And the scripture says that Jesus went and found him. And I'm in about uh, verse 35. Click over the face. Jesus finds him. And when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe in the Son of God? And the man says to him, uh, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Verse 36. And I like Jesus' response. He says, You have both seen him. Has that man ever seen anything before? <laughs> you have both seen him, or you're looking at him, and I'm the one that's talking to you. The one you see and the one talking to you is the Lord now, if you were this man, how would you answer that question? Do you believe in the Son of God? Would you answer, no? <laughs> no. Notice what he said. He said, I believe. And he worshipped him. I believe. And he worshipped him. Chapter 6. Jesus has just fed 5,000 plus people with five little pieces of bread and two fish. And they gather up 12 baskets of extra so nobody could say they ran out. I didn't get any. <laughs> there was, have you ever thought about that? There was, nobody had an excuse to say, well, I didn't get any. They had 12 extra baskets of the food. There were people who were saying, this is truly the prophet who has come. And they wanted to take him and to make him king. And Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to get in the boat and go back to Capernaum. And he said to the people, I want you to go home. And he went into the mountain. The disciples waited, and they waited, and it got darker and darker and then they finally got in the boat and left. And the people who were hanging around hadn't seen Jesus get in that boat. But a little bit later, as the disciples were rowing toward Capernaum, and they hadn't gone too far, maybe two or three miles, I don't know. The wind comes up, there's quite a storm, it's dark, and Jesus comes walking to them on the water. He steps in the boat, and it's really very interesting. There in verse uh, 19, you have this story where he's walking on the sea, and they were afraid, and he says, It is I, do not be afraid. And they got him in the boat, and we'll notice verse 21. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Have you ever read that and thought about that? 
It's like when Jesus stepped into the boat, boom, they were at Capernaum. All right? Now, the people who had been there, they saw the disciples go. They knew where they were going. And they went to Capernaum to see Jesus again. And lo and behold, they were shocked to see Jesus standing there. And they asked a very logical question. And that question was, how did you get here? Or when did you get here? We saw you go into the mountain. We saw your disciples leave. There was no boat there. How did you get here? Notice what Jesus says. Verse 26. You seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. What was their reason for seeking him again? Yeah, free lunch, exactly right. They were, they had a need uh, for food. And he says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus offered the woman at the well living water, and now he's offering them the bread of life, which was himself. Notice what they said to him, verse 28. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? It's like they missed the whole point of what Jesus had just said. And they said, what must we do? That's basically what they're saying. What does God want us to do? Just about every religion has that question. What do we do to please the gods? What do we not do to keep the gods from not getting angry at us? What do I have to do? Do I have to walk this many miles? Do I have to make this pilgrimage? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? To please God, to satisfy God. All of them do that except Christianity. Christianity says God did it for you. Just accept it. Isn't that true? But notice what Jesus said. Verse 29. Very critical. Because he answers their question this time. What must we do? This is the work of God. What does it say there? That you what? Believe in him who he sent. That's what you need to do, if you please. That's pretty simple, right? If he had given them a list of do's and don'ts, you can probably be sure they would have worked really hard to do them and not do them. Weren't the Jews already doing that? Yes, they were. But Jesus said, this is what God wants you to do, and that is believe in me that he has sent. And then they said, verse 30, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? I read this story and I said, oh man, these people really were blind. What had they just seen? He fed 5,000 people, right? That's one sign. They saw him go from here to there without a boat. That's another sign. The disciples had seen him walking on the water. That was another sign. They had watched him calm the storm. That was another sign. And here they're saying, what sign will you do that we will believe? What a contrast to the blind man who said, yes, I believe. He didn't ask for a sign. He said, I believe. You know, there's one... Uh, go over to chapter 7, verse 5. There's one, one text here that's really very sad. It says, For even his brothers did not believe in him. Now I want you to think about that. What kind of evidence did his brothers have as Jesus grew up in Nazareth? Think about it. 
wouldn't you think that they would have noticed that he spoke and acted very differently than other little boys? That he was very kind, he was very courteous, he didn't do anything naughty, he was always helpful. Wouldn't you think that over those 30 years of his growing up there and seeing how he ministered to the people in the community, that they say, he's, he's different. And then I'm sure they heard reports of all of these things that Jesus had been doing. And yet the scripture says, even his brothers did not believe in him. Can you imagine how heartrending that was for Jesus? And how he wanted to save his own brothers, but they wouldn't believe he was the Messiah who came to die for them. John chapter 8. We have a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. And there's quite a conversation going on there. And in the course of this conversation, we get to verse 30. And it says, and there are people standing around, so it's not just between he and the Pharisees. Verse 30 says, and he spoke these words, many believed in him. So they were believing what he was saying, all right? And the last thing that he just said is, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Jesus was talking about his relationship with his father here, which really was very upsetting to the Pharisees. But because of what he said, there were many standing around and said, yeah, we believe, we believe. And Jesus turned to these people in verse 31. Notice what he says. If you abide in my word, you know, hang on to it, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, the Pharisees jump back in at that particular point. And in this conversation that, that continues on, you have Jesus saying, you are of the father of the devil, not of Abraham. You have murder and killing in your minds. That wasn't in Abraham's mind. And then he says over here in verse 45 and verse 46, notice what he says. Because I tell the truth, you do not what? Isn't that an interesting sentence? I'm telling you the truth, but you won't believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? Can any of you out there tell me? that I've done something wrong? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? It's a good question, don't you think? If I tell you the truth, why don't you believe me? He had told the truth to the woman at the well, and what did she do? She believed him. He had told the truth to the blind man, go and wash and you'll see. What did he do? He believed, all right? In these stories, you can see that no matter what Jesus did and no matter what he said, the Pharisees would not believe what he said. And yet everything he said was the truth. And this must have been very Difficult for Jesus, no matter what he did, he couldn't get them to believe. Chapter 11. Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. And Jesus tells his disciples, I am glad for your sake that I was not there that you may believe. Do you understand what he was saying here? What would have happened if Jesus, when he had got the message, had gone directly to, to Bethany into the home? Would Lazarus have died? Huh? No. No. They were good friends. I cannot imagine Jesus traveling back to Bethany and staying and he's healed thousands of people perhaps by this time, walking into the house and standing there and watching Lazarus get weaker and weaker and finally die. I just can't see that happening. So there was a reason why Jesus said, 
It's a good thing I wasn't there because I want you to believe. Now, he's talking to his disciples or anybody else who might have been around that you may believe. Now, do you remember what Martha said when she met Jesus? Look at verse 21. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Was that a true statement? I believe that was an absolute true statement. Okay? She knew that Jesus would not have let his good friend Lazarus die. Notice what she else she says. But even now I know, I believe, that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. That was her belief system. That was her belief system. Now, they continue this conversation. And I want you to follow along in this conversation. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Remember, Jesus only spoke the what? Truth. Okay? Was that the true statement then? Yes. And notice Martha's response. I know, that's a belief, I know, I believe that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So Martha has some pretty good understanding there, don't you think? And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He's talking about one group of people there that died believing in Jesus. Now he's going to speak about the living saints. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? She said, and I like what she said. Look what she said here. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into this world. How that must have thrilled Jesus' heart, don't you think? Here was somebody who just flat out said it out loud, and his disciples heard it, and anybody else who was around heard it. You are God, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. I believe that. I believe that. In my imagination, I, my, Jesus maybe turned around to his disciples. Did you just hear what she said? <laughs> Did you just hear what she said? She believes I am the Son of God. But there were others that were standing around who didn't believe. And I want you to notice in verse 32. <clears throat> now, notice Mary had the same belief system here, okay? And she said to Jesus in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So they were in agreement about Jesus in regards to healing and Jesus heard some people casting doubts and he groaned in his spirit and I want you to look at verse 34 excuse me 33 therefore when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. There were doubters there, and Jesus knew that. Verse 37, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Do you see doubt there? Couldn't he have done this? Couldn't he have kept him? There's doubt there. Satan, I think, threw that out there. And Jesus maybe heard that comment. And he groaned inside. Put yourself in his shoes if you can. He, he has done all of these signs and wonders, and yet there are people standing there that would not believe. They would not believe. And then we have in verse 35... Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Could preach a whole sermon on that one about, I have one that's called Our Emotional God. <laughs> Jesus wept. And the Jews thought it was because he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. 
Desire of Ages gives us a different perspective. Jesus was crying because of the unbelief that was all around him. He was not crying because of Lazarus, was he? Why? Because he knew Lazarus was going to be up and walking around in a few minutes, thank you very much. So he was not crying over the death of Lazarus. Okay? I think he was grieving with Martha and Mary over the loss, but he was going to fix that in a moment. He was grieving over the unbelief. It goes on and says, he was crying because in spite of what he was about to do, there were people standing there who would not believe in him. He was going to do something most startling and most amazing, but they still would not believe. And he was crying because of their unbelief, because of their hard hearts, and he couldn't do anything more to get them to believe. Nothing would help them to believe. He was going to raise a dead man back to life. Unheard of. Never had happened before. And they still would not believe. And they actually wanted to kill him. Do you understand why he was crying? It was not sadness because of death. Jesus has power over death. Does he not? It was sorrow over unbelief. He has no power over unbelief. I want you to ponder that for a minute. He can't make you believe. He can make you alive if you're dead, but he can't make you believe. Now, notice these words in verse 39 and 40. Take away the stone. Martha said, Lord, by this time there is a stench where he has been dead four days. Notice what he says to her. Did I not say to you that if you what? If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Now do you understand why he said to his disciples, I'm, I'm not there, but I, I stayed here so that you would Believe, all right? And then Jesus utters a prayer. And he says this. And he's praying to the Father. And he's praying out loud for a reason. I know that you always hear me. This is verse 42. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may what? they may believe that you sent me. I'm talking to you and I'm talking out loud to you so that they will believe that you sent me. And then he cries in a loud voice and I say a loud voice, okay? The scripture says with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth. I think he said it loud enough for everybody in the crowd to hear so they know who was talking and who was giving the command, not somebody else. Nothing secret going on here. I've often, I, this is aside from my notes, but I've often shared with some people, Jesus did not say, Lazarus, come down out of heaven, did he? He said, Lazarus, come forth from the tomb. That's where Lazarus was for four days, not in heaven, okay? And I then go on to say, if Lazarus had, had come down from heaven, if you believe the dead go to heaven, Lazarus would surely have said something about what he saw for those four days. Not one person that has been raised from the dead ever talks about that, ever. That was a side note, okay? <laughs> All right, but I'd like, to, I'd like to suggest that Jesus needed to say Lazarus by name because there's a possibility that if he hadn't said, Lazarus, come forth, that maybe there are other dead people in the cemeteries close by. They would have heard that resurrection voice and come out of the grave. That would have been quite an event, don't you suppose? Because we know that when he does come, he says, all you saints, what? Arise. And how many come out? All of them. So 
I think he was very specific here on purpose. Lazarus, come out. Not everybody, come out. And uh, that is an interesting thing to think about. Now, notice verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary to, to comfort her and had seen the things Jesus did, what? Believed in him. So what Jesus had told his disciples did come true. And that was what it was all about. I want to do something so that you will believe that I am the Son of God, that I was sent by God, and now you really can't ignore it because this man, Lazarus, is walking around talking. One more story. Mark 9. Mark 9 is a story... That happens just after Jesus had taken Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration. There they had seen something that was awesome because they saw the glory of God because Jesus had said, there are some of you standing here today. They will not die before they see Jesus coming into his kingdom. They saw Jesus glorified. He became king right in front of them. And Moses was there and Elijah was there, and they heard God's voice saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. They'd come down the mountain. I can imagine Peter, James, and John are just really going over what they had seen. And they see a group of people down there. And as they approach, the people become excited. Now, what is happening down there as they come down the mountain is... The disciples are in a group, and they have a whole bunch of people around them, and a man had brought to them a, his son, who was possessed of a demon. Now, he had come to ask the disciples, who had been given authority earlier to cast out demons, and had done so, and he brought his son for them to do that, and they couldn't do it. And in the, in the crowd, I imagine there were these scribes and Pharisees that were making the most of this failure on the part of the disciples and accusing and telling the people, see, we told you they're frauds. And their leader is a fraud. And they're spewing out these words of doubt into everybody's minds. And when the people see Jesus, they rush toward him. And I can just imagine these scribes and Pharisees kind of just maybe stepping back a little bit and say, um, mm, uh, we'll see what happens now. Um, maybe he's going to embarrass us. And the father steps forward and he explains what's going on. And he says, the devil takes possession of my son. And he throws him down and he foams at the mouth and he becomes rigid and he gnashes his teeth. And I brought him to your disciples to get the demon thrown out and they couldn't do it. Now, imagine Jesus standing there looking over the crowd and he reads all of their minds. He knows the believers and he knows the unbelievers. And he says these words. He says, verse 19, Oh, faithless, or that would be unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Can you almost just hear the anguish in his voice there? How long are you going to not believe who I am. In spite of everything I've done, you won't believe. Must have been really heartrending for Jesus. And Jesus asked the man to bring his son to him. Now, just for a moment, I want you to think about this father's belief system. He must have heard that that Jesus and his disciples were casting out demons. Somewhere along the line he heard that. Otherwise he wouldn't have come, right? If he did believe, 
he would have never gone, however far he had to go to try to find relief for his son. So he had a little bit of belief. We have to give him credit for that. And that belief brought him to Jesus. He thought he was coming to Jesus, but Jesus had gone up into the mountain that evening. So let's, let's say that he had some. So the man brings his son to Jesus and the demon immediately takes possession of this boy again and throws him on the ground and takes complete control of him. And use your wildest imagination of this, this boy kicking and screaming and, and screeching sounds that you and I could just hardly bear because it's, it's not this boy screeching, it's the demons screeching and Jesus just stands there. And he lets him demonstrate his power. He lets the devil show what he's got. Can you imagine the emotions of the father while this is going on? And then Jesus asks a question. He says, how long has this been going on? And the father in anguish by now because of seeing what's going on there, he says, ever since he was a child, the demon tried to burn him by throwing him in the fire and the demon tried to drown him by throwing him into the lake. But if you can do anything for us, have compassion on us and help us. Stop right there. What did you hear in that sentence? But if. But if. What, yeah, what is that? Doubt. There was some unbelief there, wasn't there? He didn't say, he could have said, but he didn't say, you can do anything, please help us. He didn't say that. He said, but if you can do anything. And I can imagine Jesus makes direct eye contact with this father. And he says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. What did Jesus start that sentence with? If. <laughs> a condition there. And what was the condition? You need to believe. And if you believe what? Anything can happen. I can do anything. But you have to do your part. And that's you have to believe. Was there any lack on the part of Jesus to deal with this demon? None. Okay? Jesus was not talking about that. The healing was not dependent upon Jesus, was it? The healing was dependent upon what? The belief of the Father, okay? It was completely dependent on the faith and belief of this Father. And when Jesus heard, I'm sorry, when, when the Father heard Jesus' words, it became instantly clear to him that the weakness was with him, not with Jesus. You get that? He realized, if I don't believe enough, if I don't believe that Jesus could do this, my son is helpless. I can't cast the demon out. He can't cast the demon out. I need to believe that Jesus can cast him out. That is an important point I want you to get. He had a self-realization that my belief is weak and I need to believe completely that Jesus can do what he says he can do. And he, I can just imagine that he, he kneels down in front of Jesus and he bursts into tears. And he says to Jesus, he says, Lord, that's in verse 24, Lord, I believe, help what? He's not even talking about his son anymore, is he? Help my unbelief. I need to grow my belief. I need to believe completely in you. And I think Jesus could read his heart, and he knew that this man totally was believing that he could do this. And so to honor this man's belief, he turns to the demon, and he says, deaf and dumb, I'm in verse 25, deaf and dumb spirit, I say to you, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. 
Now remember, Jesus was commander of the entire heavenly hosts. All of the angels are under his command. And his commands are obeyed by the angels. And even this evil angel, though he was here on this earth, Jesus was still his commander in chief. So he had to obey. Didn't want to, but he had to. And so with a shriek and a convulsion, that's verse 26, he violently just rends this boy's body, so to speak, and leaves. And the boy just lies there. Everybody thinks that he's dead, verse 26. He's dead. He's dead. But Jesus just leans down and helps him up and gives him to his father. Can you imagine the conversation and the excitement as they went home and when they got home? And what a witness that man was. Because this man could go around the community and say, he was healed because I believed. He was almost not healed because I almost didn't believe. I want you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I have a couple of questions for you. Do you have doubts about Jesus? Do you have doubts about what he can do for you personally? And I'm going to start including myself. Do we have any unbelief that he says, I will forgive you of your sins if you confess them to me? Do we think, mm, I don't know whether he will do that or not. I have so many sins. Or can we do what these people did and said, Lord, yes, I believe. You will forgive my sins because you said you would. Do I have doubts about my insurance? Because Jesus had said, if you believe in me and I'm your Savior, if you put yourself in my hands, nobody can take you out. Do you believe that? Or do you have doubts? Because Jesus said, anybody who comes to me, what does he say? I will in no wise cast out. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he can help you, me, overcome sin in our lives? Or is that too tough for God? Just like the leprosy or the demon possession I would encourage you and me also to believe that Jesus can cast out a demon. The demon has to go. And if you ask him, Lord, get this sin out of my life, and Jesus can say, okay, I will get rid of it for you, don't doubt him. Don't doubt him. If you have an addiction, is that too strong for Jesus? Or if you come to him as these people that I believe you can help me get rid of this addiction. He can do that. On what condition? If you believe that he can do that and that he will do that. I mean, we can stand and say, yeah, I believe Jesus is coming soon. Oh, yeah. But what about some really personal stuff? Say, can Jesus do this in my life? Yes, I would suggest you need to say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I think should be in your bulletin a little paragraph. If it's not there, there should be some out there. I'd like to close with this paragraph. She starts by quoting this man. If you do anything, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Many a Christian Many a sin-burdened soul has echoed that prayer. And to all, the pitying Savior's answer is, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. It is faith, that's the believing, that connects us with heaven and brings us strength for coping with the powers of darkness. 
In Christ, God has provided means for, notice this, subduing every sinful trait, resisting every temptation, however strong. But many feel that they lack faith, and therefore they remain away from Christ. Let these souls, in their helplessness, unworthiness, cast themselves upon the mercy of their compassionate Savior. Look not to self, but to Christ. He who healed the sick and cast out the demons when he walked among men is the same mighty Redeemer today. Faith comes by the word of God. Then grasp his promise. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Cast yourself at his feet with the cry, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You can never perish while you do this. Never. I want to close with a song that's based on this story. I want you to listen carefully to the words. Maybe put yourself in the picture. And if Listen to what the man says. Go ahead, Denny. He came to speak with Jesus for his only son. Lord, please heal this child, if you can. Jesus said, believe it, and it shall be done. The key to what you seek is in your hands. How could he rely on simple words alone? beyond what stood before his eyes. But in his heart he knew that he was not that strong. So he turned his face to Jesus and he cried. Lord, I believe Sometimes the doubts won't go away. It's hard to hold. Two things I cannot prove to be. To cast my hope on things unseen, I believe. Lord, I believe. Please help my unbelief, I pray. Though I have faith. Sometimes the doubts don't go away, it's hard to hold. Two things I cannot prove to be, to cast my hope on things unseen, yet I believe. Lord, give me faith to know that you are ever near.
your life here. Your desire was to get people to believe that you were the Son of God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Savior and Redeemer. It is Satan's job to get us to unbelieve, to not believe, and to doubt. So when we have this Father's prayer in our heart today, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And we know that you will do that and that you will do anything that you have promised to do. And we can count on it if we believe. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good Sabbath. Glad you're here.